Welcome back. Welcome back to uh, Juke Joint Part 3. And um, please give it up one more time for, from the left, Stu. <laughs> and next to me, having given us an incomparable interpretation of Big Mama Thornton last night, Pamela Sneed. Hi, Pamela. Hi, Stu. I'm, Hi, Tavia. I'm really, really thrilled. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, uh, it, it's some version of what, Stu, you were talking about happening on TikTok. Like, is this really happening? <laughs> you know, to have the two of you here in, um, in conversation and about your work and about its relation to the, um, what, uh, what maybe we could call it like the juke continuum right, or the experimental blues continuum, uh, as you were just calling it uh, today, Stu. I wanted to begin by asking the two of you to talk about the relationship between your work as artists and the, um, uh, and, and the written word, right? You know, Pamela, you're a poet. You have been working on this new show that uh, is debuting a relationship to song, but you've been writing and you incorporate your poetry into the Big Mama tribute. Stu, as we just learned today, you are always writing, <laughs> even up into the show itself, but often in the medium of song. So just talk about what, um, you know, what, how you incorporate writing, what the role of that is in your creative process and what, if any, differences there are between writing music and poetry. Poetry as in like sitting at home writing as opposed to, when you say poetry, you're just like, like just writing st words and music, the difference between? Well, what specifically about music and the words in music? Like how did you find the song and the song lyric as a specific medium for written expression. Oh, 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 I think for oh, you. oh, I see. I see what you mean. Yeah. Oh, because to me, there's no difference, really. I mean, the, 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 for growing up, I, I I never knew song. Like I'm a lyric person supposedly, but any of my students will tell you that I'm actually not. I don't know the lyrics to anything. You know, I I, I to this day, I recently just found out like forever. See, I came into the, the chorus to "You Are the Sunshine of My Life," which I have heard countless times. But I just looked at the lyric sheet recently. I was like, I never knew that's what he was saying, <laughs> you know? Uh, so for me, it's like words and music come at the same time. And the poets I like are very musical, you know? So I kind of just, it's always been the same thing. It's just kind of like, you know, for me, it was always, me. And it's like, what is he saying? My whole world ended the moment you left me. You know, that Motown song, you know? And it's like, but I heard that lyric, I heard that lyric for, you know, 35, 40 years before knowing. So I'm actually a music person. To me, the lyric is, is actually, it should be like music. And I don't learn anything about writing until I'm doing, like right today, I learned more about this writing that I was doing than I learned being with this audience taught me more about that writing than being at home ever could. So it's, it's all the same process for me, you know. Um, hmm. There are a lot of things to say. I'm wearing my glasses because I had a rough night in the juke joint last night, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I was like, I threw some stuff on. I was like, I'm wearing my glasses. Um, yeah, it's rough up in here, right? Um, so one, um, I mean, I wrote an essay, I think, for Leslie Lohman uh, a couple of years ago, and, um, and, and it was called It's All Poetry to Me, 
you know? <laughs> and so, I mean, I'm definitely a, an interdisciplinary artist, but like, I think like every single artist, when they reach the, the top or the peak of their form, that they become the poet. Right, that everybody becomes a poet, and like you know, if you have, um, you know, if you're working in film, and they'll say, you know, the highest compliment is it's it's poetry. You know what I mean? And so I feel like you know, an artist in whatever medium, when they really hit their their stride, their thing, when their voice comes out, when it's like when they transcend, that's when they become the poet, right? So, so poetry is always there. There's no, there's no separation. Um, but interestingly enough, I said to, you know, I was saying to Stacy Penson, uh, who works with Bill T. Jones, and and um, and basically they were the keyboard person. And I went to Stacy, and Stacy's kind of terrifying, right? Because Stacy's like very, very hard. And they're like, you know, you're gonna learn this song. And I'm like, ah, ah, ah you know, she's Musical scaring direction. me, right? And. Um, and so, but basically, I was like, you know, take it easy on me because, like, I'm new at this. And he's like, no, you're not. And I was like, no, Stacey, I mean, he's like, no, you're not. And so, in a way, like, Stacey, you know, like a black queer man is also, like, say he knows that how far down deep, you know, the music goes in my soul. So he's not really going to allow me to stand there and say, oh, no, Stacey, I'm new, I'm new, you know. Um, so that, so yeah, I mean, I come out of the church, you know, my grandfather was a Baptist preacher, you know, my grandmother sang spirituals, and so that sense of music, music, poetry, theater, you know, everything, you know, visual art, everything was embedded in the church, everything was embedded into my DNA, right? And, um, and so, yeah, so it was just kind of like, like I think a lot about um, this idea of like speaking in tongues, you know, and so, and I feel like I speak in so many tongues, you know what I mean? And that's where art has brought me. Um, and then the other thing is, is like interesting, um, when I was talking to Tom, who we trained together with Susan Batson like back in the day in very, like very traditional kinds of theater and stuff like that. And I was like, I don't want to do a play, right? And Tom's like, what? You know, and I'm like, I'm not a play. I want performance, performance, you know? And I want it to be devised work, right? And so I didn't walk in with the script. I learned the script. I created the script as we walked through it. And, um, and I think that that was important to the process, yeah. There, when I was in church one day and we were trying to sneak out like we always did in the back row and the, the minister was talking about he had some theme he was doing and so me and uh, Edwina Williams and a couple of the people we had it timed where we knew when he went into his thing when he when he hit peak his first peak we could exit right <laughs> so so I would happen to be the last one to go so Edwina goes you know Robert goes and then I'm at the last one and when I get to the aisle he goes in the loudest voice I've ever said, God is watching you, Stuart. Uh -oh. And I completely froze. And he made the sermon about us kids in the back row. He completely changed the sermon to include. And then he wound back. You know, he wound back to where he originally was. But he spent five minutes on us. And at that moment, I realized, I kind of want to do something. I want to be able to do something kind of like that. I don't, I, don't, I, 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 I don't know exactly what, because I was about 12, but I was like, he had one thing, and then he did this other thing, you know? And, and you know what I mean? But isn't that like kind of like Nina Simone? Oh, of course it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When she's like, turn is. up, you come in late. Of course and it right, is. And, and Nina's like, turn up the house lights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Turn up the house lights. And like the person's like, you know, and exactly. she's like, exactly. why are you coming to my show late? Right, right, right. Yeah. But that's writing, you know, like that's writing. Like he wrote something. He just happened to, they call it improvised, which to me is kind of like, okay, you can have that word. But improvised sounds like I really didn't care or it's not that important or it's just this thing I came up with. It's not just this thing. It's writing. He wrote on the spot a bit about us godless children, uh, <laughs> you know, and it, and he, again, fit it into his theme. So to me, that was writing. That wasn't like, ooh, he just came up with something. He wrote. It seems like in that example, 
uh, which is going to haunt me, having been one of the kids snucking, <laughs> having snuck out of, out of church in my day, that um, you're, you're both talking about call and response, right? And how a kind of writing happens, you know, in the juke continuum, like through call and response, right? And through that uh, interaction between an artist on stage and an audience, like present or imagined, right? You know, and, um, and I wanted to, you know, we just, we're, we we have just experienced you know your new um, uh, show uh, or to borrow from Nina Simone uh, show tunes for a song for a musical that hasn't been written yet, <laughs> um, and you know so we're thinking about this 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 character that you're inventing um, in front of us Stu, and then uh, we're calling back the homage that um, Pamela gave last night of Big Mama Thornton, and how do you each approach? Uh, persona, right? When you're kind of giving, um, uh, when you're inventing, I want to say inventing a character, but also in in your case, Pamela doing doing research and paying homage, right? Like, what's the what's the balance between homage and uh, and invention? Um, well, I think you know, as I said before, I didn't want it to be a play. So I didn't want people to come in and it's like, I'm Big Mama Thornton. And now back, you know, in 1926, when I was born, you know, I didn't want that, right? So I kind of, I, you know, um, I guess I, kind, I wanted it to be a channeling because I think that that's the most you know, brilliant kind of like acting, right? Is like not when you're, you know, deadpan, like kind of like, uh, what is it, copying everything that the artist did, but when you, you capture the essence of them, right? And so that's, so I constructed things around trying to capture her essence. And I know last night that I felt like most like her, like when I had the hat on and um, and I'm just sort of like working the crowd, you know, and like and like because I mean she posed. If you look at all her things, like she had angle, angle, you know. She's like looking, and she'll just sit there and she has a cigarette, and she's working it, you know. And so like working the stage like that, I felt like the essence of Big Mama Thornton, and also that she she absolutely loved to perform, you know. So I mean. Part of what comes out is that it was like such a hard life for her, but the woman found this joy that was unbelievable in performance, right? And um, and I mean, I had to like work a lot, like you know, because I can be shy or I could be like you know have stage fright or like whatever. And um, and it was like okay, with Big Mama Thornton, you got to be big girl, you know what I mean? You can't shrink, you know, you got to step in those shoes, right? And so she's a real challenge, you know, to like step up, step out, you know, because you can't. Um, you can't shirk away from it, you know, and for her to be like, you know, on the road since she was 14 years old, you know, I mean, found singing on the back of a garbage truck, you know, and, um, and I was thinking about that on my way here, that, you know, that this woman who was saved by Diamond Teeth Mary, who heard her singing and said, you know, audition for the Hot Harlem Review, right, so that the, the girl person who was saved ended up saving us, right? And so I just think that that's like a really beautiful lineage, legacy, you know? Yeah. I mean, that that garbage truck, you know? It's like, like uh, it kills me, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Am I supposed to be answering a question? Yeah, about, about okay. dude. Persona. Lucky dude. Uh, I don't know about persona. It's like, I'm, I'm really into comedians. I was really into... Richard Pryor from a very early age. If you could believe that, like, you know, uh, Richard Pryor records were played in, in fine, middle-class black American households all over America, and nobody had a problem with it. So I was really interested in Pryor's... When you talk about personas, it wasn't like... It was like whatever the persona is when you're performing, that's the persona. I've never invented a single character. I wouldn't know how to do that. You know, I just look at the actor I'm working with and go, like, what do you do? I'm going to do something that I know you're going to like. I'm going to write something that I know you're going to like. But with comedians, that persona was like, I am the person up here telling these difficult truths, and I'm making you laugh, and that's what stops you from beating me up, you know? So I was always fascinated by that dangerous comedian thing, and then when I found out how much Pryor was influenced by, specifically by um, Lenny Bruce, but in general by uh, a lot of uh, Jewish humor, I, I grew up a lot in a, in a black Jewish neighborhood, and the irreverence 
of the Jewish humor I grew up with was, it was like punk rock before punk rock. Like, I can't tell you the jokes that they used to say, <laughs> the Jewish jokes that they used to say in high school, at my high school. It was like, you were like, you know, like, damn, okay. But like, you know, but like, this is a world where their deep tragedy was decades away, right? Uh, and so I was like, wow, how do you, you guys are doing this weird thing. Like, you're taking this really fucked up shit. You know, I mean, as much as I'm, I'm not the biggest Mel Brooks fan in the world, but the producers is a formative, not the producers to play, but the idea, the, the, the idea that someone actually sat there and went like, we're gonna do this. What? You know what I mean? And like, that, so the persona to me is this person that's gonna go out front and say these things and do these things in this kind of dangerous way and see if he can get away with it, you know? But I, I just, I just, yeah, I just love that. I love that, that Pryor was just so, I thought, I thought no one could influence Pryor. Pryor was just born, formed, you know. And then when he was like, oh no, like Lenny Bruce, all this, all this Catskill stuff that Pryor was really into, I was like, oh, okay, irreverence, irreverence. So for me today, I just felt like W.E.B. and Booker T. have this relationship, and I just thought, okay, what if W.B. is this kid, and Booker T. is this, like, angel who comes and fucks with it, you know? So we have this rich history, and I just like to play with it, you know? I just like to play with it. I like to play with it in ways that sometimes might make people mad, but that's, again, that's the part of being a comedian to me, you know? Yeah, actually, my secret passion is to be a comedian. Oh, God. Yeah, oh, yeah, me too, yeah, me too. Yeah. 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 I'm not brave enough, but I, mean, yeah. that's, I would love to. Yeah, no, I love it. I mean, I write satire, so, yeah. You know, um, and it seems that that's part of the juke joint vibe, right? Is that mixture of social commentary, music, dance, right? Juke is like a dance continuum, right? You know, and, and, and comedy, right? You know, comedy is always, you know, those records. You mentioned um, Mom's Maybelline in your show mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, Pamela. Um, the, uh, I want to get this question in, though, because another thing that the two of you share, um, which, again, I was reminded, um, Stu, when you talked about um, writing uh, a lot of the songs for today, uh, this past week, is that you both share a daily practice. Like, you both are artists who have really, in various times in your life, but maybe kind of throughout, um, really worked in... Um, would you call it a disciplined, a disciplined way? You know? <laughs> but like, I mean, no, I mean, there was a time, Stu, legendarily, you, you would write a song on demand, right? Or write a, you know, and Pamela, you have been known to, um, you know, to kind of post your paintings on a daily basis. Like, what is the relationship, I guess, what has your relationship been to that sort of like daily grind, if you will, of creative work and the, um, Effervescent moment of performance. Deadlines. Together. Deadlines. <laughs> deadlines, okay. <laughs> I mean, I How does the daily practice help you get to the deadline? I mean, I, I just, I, look, I, I, you have to, to me, it's, I, I don't, I never studied like how to do any of this stuff. I just studied by listening to other people do it, you know? And but yeah, the deadline, the deadline is the best thing to me. I just feel like you have to like turn shit in, you know? Only it's not school, you know? Uh, and, 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 and you, you do, you do, you, you, you just turn, you turn shit in and sometimes it's maybe horrible. I mean, like I had the, you know, it's a lot of pressure. I mean, I had, you know, Spike wanted me to write that, you know, clown with the nuclear code thing. And I, I refused for like a month. Because I'm just like, I don't want to write a song about Trump. I don't want to have Trump in my mind unnecessarily, you know? And he would just stalk text me like th three times a day, clown with the nuclear code, clown with the nuclear code. That's all he would say. What, like, why, please, baby, baby, please, you know? He was, it was just like, and like after like three weeks, I was like, okay, fuck, you know? But it's like, that was the hardest thing I ever wrote. I didn't put Trump's name in it because I just didn't want, you know? But it was like, the discipline of like just, it's just the deadline. It's just not wanting to fuck up. It's like fear. It's like fear of sucking, you know? That's the, that's the, that's, that's for me what it is. It's just, I, I don't claim to be good at it. I'm just, I'll finish though. I'll finish. I'll definitely finish, you know? Uh. Um, I don't think of, I don't think of it as a grind, right? I think of it as, well, I mean, I guess the thing that I'm proudest of, like, in my life at this particular point is that I've been able to make myself 
Um, but also I have a creative life that everything, you know, that I do is in service of my creativity. And so that's, I mean, that's a triumph and that's something really beautiful to me, you know? Um, so, so basically I live kind of like in a dream space, you know, in the sense that, so like at night, you know, I post the paintings, like I paint before I go to sleep. Um, April's National Poetry Month, right? And it's like, it's a poem a day, right? For 30 days. And um, I used to really resist stuff like that. But then for the last three years, I've had a, a poetry partner and it's awesome. I mean, it is awesome training, right? And so, so the bottom line is, is that um, and like I came to Big Mama Thornton, like I listened to gospel at night and um, and then her tapes started coming up and um, and I was looking at her and I was like looking at the way that she moved and like I understood something deep in my soul and I said, oh, I'm going to play her. Right. Yeah, I just saw, you know what I mean? And so in a way, like I'm just available to that to that space you know so i practice because and i also tell people that i mean sometimes yeah you have to work for deadlines but i also tell people to like you know do the thing that you love and if you love it you will continue to do it and you will make space for it you know and so that's you know i make space for the things that i love you know and that's that's what i do yeah i also want to say it's helpful teaching uh, that I'm always telling students to do things that sometimes I'm not doing in my own work. So it's a it's a it's a nice reminder to like, oh yeah, you're talking all this shit about how to correct the song, how to make it better. You might want to, you know, take your own advice sometimes. You know, so I'm 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 really privileged to be able to work with brilliant students who I'm pushing, but at the same time, you know, I'm being reminded of the things that I should be doing you know uh as well so that's always that's always good i um let me ask a follow-up on that then because you uh, said something in a ig live that we did last week Stu, about how if memory serves the i'd asked about how the pandemic changed your writing or changed your approach to impacted your life your creative life and, and you actually mentioned that it, it oriented your 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 world towards teaching in a new way and uh, Pamela, I know that you also, um, actually, having been in your classroom, I'm one of Pamela's proud students. Uh, uh, maybe too too big for his britches, right? But um, but but you both have this relationship to teaching. Um, would you say something about that? And um, and 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 what its relationship is to the storytelling practice of the Duke Joint. Uh, 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 how, how, teaching in the pandemic? You yes. Know um, well, you know, the pandemic basically, made, when we went on lockdown, I basically had to prove that all the bullshit I'd been thinking for my entire life about the importance of art was actually real. I had to make my students feel like this shit was important. And uh, it was a very big challenge. And I... I just had to work to not be full, to show, to show or to find out if I was full of shit or not. Because they were looking at me like, okay, now we want to hear all about all this like life-changing art and the properties and the, all the aspects of it that are going to somehow make us want to go on right now. What can you tell us about art making that's going to make us want to continue old man? You know what I mean? And uh, it was... Uh, it was it was challenging, you know, but it but I I think we got through it, you know. But it was really about about uh, uh, yeah, it was about believing your own bullshit, you know. Like we talk about how important it is, we talk about how life changing it is, but was it or is it? And I had to make them see that it was that it was worth it, you know. And I had to go back to all the old stuff, you know. You know, I had to go back to uh, uh, slave songs. I had to go back to slave narratives. I had to go back to Holocaust uh, art. You know, I had to go back to everything to say things have been bad before. Here's proof. And they didn't have Zoom to sit around talking to each other about it the way we do. And But, I mean, that was a huge thing to prove that art was actually important. I had never been asked to prove it. I just was saying it all the time. But we weren't, 
I wasn't proving it, and I feel like I, you know, we, we together we figured it out. I'm not like I said something that made them learn something. I think we all were just like looking at each other going, what the fuck are we going to do? Let's write a song. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, well, my friend Verna is here, and um, I've known them a very, very long time when Verna was at Henry Holt, and they published my first book, Imagine Being More Afraid of Freedom Than Slavery. And then, um, and then like two years ago, I did um, Funeral Diva, which was uh, basically kind of like a chronicle of losing my friends during the AIDS pandemic and uh, during the early part of the AIDS pandemic and like losing a lot of like black queer creatives. My I was a very young person, and um, and how devastating that was to me, and how I never got over it, and a lot of them had never been documented, and so right right in the middle of doing that was also the pandemic, and so then I wanted to do another book about you know about the pandemic, and then everybody was like, oh no, put it in this book, put it in this book, and I was like, oh okay, so then it kind of came full circle, right? But like the Times was like, no, oh, we've never seen anything like this. What is going on? It's like, what are you talking about? We've lived through pandemics before, you know what I'm saying? I lost most of my friends, you know what I mean? What are you, you know? So so no, it's not new. You're, so uh, the pandemic very much influenced my work in that way. And I think like, I mean, I don't know, like teaching, I consider it to be a spiritual practice. Like it's just something that like I do. It's a communion. It's a way of us, you know, being in conversation, doing political work. Like I consider that to be the front line for me. Right? Is that like that's where I get to make change, right? That's where I get to introduce people to new ideas. Like I always think of like uh, like one of the teachers, like the teachers like that got arrested during uh, you know during apartheid South Africa. I mean, it's still going on. But I always want to be that kind of leader. You know what I mean? It's like okay, if they come for the teachers now, which they are. They're just saying you can't teach these books or do these things, right? But if it comes to like you know getting locked up for being a leader. I, I want to be in that number, you know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. Yeah. Amen. Do we want to take some questions from the audience? Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah, okay. sure. All right. Do we have a question well, from the audience? Or you want to? Yeah, there was one more thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, of you course. Were, you were going to ask me something. <clears throat> and um, and I wanted to talk about just in terms of, like, you know, Big Mama Thornton and doing some of the re research for this project. And, um, and I mean, again, there's only one book written by her, uh, written about her at this time, right? And, like, the rest of it is, like, excerpts of different things, a lot of stuff on the Internet. And um, But one of the things that I found is that, like, there are, like, tons of, of blues singers and tons of people who've like influenced American music that have never ever, you know, people of color, black people who have never been given credit for the work that they've done, right? And so so it's not just Big Mama Thornton. I mean, she had a very distinctive voice and presence, but there are so many. And uh, one of the things that I discovered or rediscovered was that some of the roots of, of um, American music are not only black, but black and queer. Right. And so that was a really powerful part of this project, you know, to think about, again, thinking about Moms Mabley, thinking about Bessie Smith, you know, thinking about all these women, you know, who are bisexual, who are presenting as queer. And like, you know, I've done queer studies, I've done feminist studies, and they're like attributing like, you know, the queerness in the arts to like some white women in Paris, you know. And I was like, what? And I was like, what about the blues singers, you know? And um, yeah, and then, you know, so they've been disappeared from a canon, you know? And then, I mean, Little Richard, and there's a documentary out, and like, and he's like, you know, everybody in my band was a sissy, you know what I'm saying? And so, so one of the, we have not talked about the black queer foundation of American music, and that's something that I want to bring forward even more, so. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, everybody. Do we have a question from the audience? I see one in the back there. Uh, do we need a microphone? Yes, it sounds like you don't need a microphone. OK. Yes. Yes.
your ability to improvise um, or how it impacts your ability to just create what you create. When you say dynamic rhythm, do you just mean like, is there like an official definition of that? Or, um, or, or, or I'll just answer what I think it is. <laughs> uh, absolutely every single thing, especially if we're talking about like comedy stuff, like between song banter and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. It's all rhythm. You know, it's all syllables, right? And I think at some point you either get lucky, you know, that you fall on the right amount of syllables, but I think it is also just like, you start to think that way anyway, you know? You just start to think in rhythm, so you don't have, that's why I say it's not really, to me, it's not really, like I made something up, it's like, no, I wrote something, you know? That was, but you're writing in, you're writing in rhythm, you know? Uh, the poet T.S. Eliot, when he was five, he used to come up to his mom and say, I just wrote a poem. And he would say, oh, let me hear it. And he would go, and then they were like, oh, man, my kid's got a problem, right? But what Eliot was doing, he was writing the music. He was writing the rhythm. He didn't have the words because he was five, but he knew that this is something that's working somehow that is not like normal spoken language and it's a poem. He thought it was a poem and it was, right? But it was pure rhythm, you know? It was absolute pure rhythm and sound. So yeah, I think you just sort of train yourself to, 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 to not, I don't know how you consciously train yourself, but, you just, but thinking in rhythm is, is, is to me is the key, you know? Things just come out the right way sometimes, you know? And, but I also think there's the bravery. I think the bravery factor is really what, it, being willing to go with the irreverent, the, the irreverent dot to connect, you know, the dot that might not be right, but it's beautiful in, in, in its wrongness, you know, the thing that you don't want to maybe say, but you just go fuck it, and then uh, that usually has a rhythm. Irreverence has a rhythm, definitely, you know. Uh, there's, there's a, there's a, I mean, if you just listen to like old school, like old school, like Catskills type comedy, there's actually a, almost like a defensive rhythm. Like I'm going to say this, but then I'm going to say this, but then I'm going to qualify that, but then, and it's like, they're called, they're almost like dodging. You know what I mean? Like I know I'm about to say some crazy shit, you know? And it's just like, yeah, you just have to be, I think the rhythm is always, always there. It is rhythm. I think that's what it is. Yeah, I was just thinking about um, like improvisation in the sense of like thinking about like devising the script as opposed to like walking in with something ready made. And so that there's this idea that you sort of set up the context and you, know, you start to like move through, you start to have conversations and then it becomes like an act of listening. It's an act of being present and it's an act of listening and then you start to respond to that. And then you sort of take the, the script out of that or you take the music out of that. Like, you know, last night people were also talking about like that call and response and feeling part of it and there were things that I did you know in response to the audience that weren't planned at all but like feeding off of that energy that's like right there so you have to stay awake you have to stay aware to be present and you also have to listen like all art is like an act of listening you know middle section, I realized that uh, I've got to address the group. So, so I have to write something else, right? So again, it's not improvisation, it's just like, it's just like the situation calls for <laughs> something, right. you know, to, to, to pretend like other people, other ears weren't here would have been just funny and cowardly, right? So it's like I just complained to people in the room, you know, because that's also the story. That's also the story, you know, that, that there are white people in this particular room of that scene right now, not just me, and how that northern, how that New England black kid is looking at southern Mississippi black folks and these white folks. That triangulation thing is like, 
it was a very sort of a inspiring combination. So that it did not occur to me for a second to bring white people into it until I was standing there. And then I realized, oh shit, this song's being complete. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> That's what's good about instrumental sex. Is co co comedians don't have that. Hey, let them play a violin solo while I figure this shit out. <laughs> That's what's so fucking great about having a band, you know? It's so great about having a band. Just do that while I figure this. I want to throw a question in there, piggybacking on, on that last answer. Again, to the two of you, I, um, the last, maybe the last time, or like the last time the, um, the urban blues uh, came to New York City, you know, in a big way was probably like the folk of blues revival, right? Of like the 40s and 50s, right? And that's a era that, um, Pamela, you actually touch upon in your show, right? Because that's when Big Mama Thornton goes on the road with um, Janis Joplin, right? You know, and Janis Joplin is, <laughs> 60s, well, okay, so it it, it it rides into the 60s, right? And, and, and maybe actually that's the, um, it's interesting to get artists even like um, Little Richard who are, Briefly seen as revivalists, even though they were, um, you know, innovators and progenitors of rock and roll. Like a mere decade later, are seen as, um, as old time in some way, right? Mm -hmm. How do we get outside of this idea that, like, the juke and the kind of experimental blues that you were um, giving us a um, more than a taste of today, Stu? It belongs in the past, right? I mean, it does belong in the past, right? But also, it's it's clearly a matrix out of which. Uh, black musical and political and humor and so many other elements today and in the future are, are created. How do we get to that that sense of a living tradition that's not just kind of looking back to? My students are like, they just send me TikTok stuff, like I said, and I just go like, okay, this is what you're doing now. This is what y'all are doing. All I can do is tell them what happened. I do not have an answer for you because I don't. I mean, I suspect that they will figure it out because artists always end up going. I don't know what the fuck to do. I better look back. You know, eventually they look back. They might not look back all the time, but eventually they look back. Sometimes it's an accident, or sometimes they just have this weirdo like me in their life, who once a week says, "There's this thing called this. There's this thing called that. You might want to have a look at it." But um, I. I mean, I'm all like, I'm, I don't know how you would, <laughs> it's actually like they know better than we know how they're going to deal with all this stuff that we're talking about. I am confident that they will find Big Mama Thornton. I'm confident they will find it. I believe they will find Big Mama Thornton because the hugeness of the artistry is such where it will be found. It somebody because somebody needs it. If somebody needs it, I think it can be found. You know, I just I, I but th it's going to be found on their terms, and I don't <laughs> always know what their terms are. I'm trying to figure them out. But yeah, I do, I don't I don't I don't I don't know I don't know. I gotta say that there's really interesting things happening on TikTok. Believe it or not, and if I would have heard me say that three months ago, I would have said. That's bullshit, but there's actually really interesting, edgy, weird, cool shit going on, and I only know this, like I said, from what my students send me, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know how they're gonna, I don't know. Um, well, one, I believe that America tells her story in terms of music. Right. And so that's why we have all these shows or whatever behind the music, the music the you know, um, and we're, we're fascinated with the musicians. Right. Of our time. And so in that regard, I feel like there's always like, you know, the musicians are like in a way they speak to our culture. They control our culture. I mean, everything, you know, our whole beings. Right. Are shaped by the music of the time. Right. And so in that regard, I feel like it's really important that that young people are always going to come to that, right? And then, um, 
And I mean, it was interesting, you know, because then we had the kids that were here yesterday and I didn't know how it was going to play. But like they got into like the soul of it. You know what I mean? They're responding to, you know, seeing me move through these things. And then also saying that, you know, the common story, the reason why I, you know, went to Big Mama Thornton was because when I was a young black lesbian, like sort of coming up in New York and like there weren't many role models. There wasn't there wasn't any place to like really look. And um, in the blues singers, it was like through the black lesbian poetry scene, I started hearing about the blues singers. And like that helped me to sort of like shape myself, right? And so I feel like, you know, all these young people and people in general that are like looking, you know, to find themselves, a lot of times they find themselves in music, you know, and that's what's gonna, you know, sort of like, get them to, you know, and I mean Doja Cat and all these other people are like doing remixes of Big Mama Thornton and stuff like that. But I mean, tons of people said I've never heard of her, never heard of her, never heard of her, right? And, um, but I feel like the story that I told was not, you know, just about like this woman, but how I came to need this woman, mm -hmm. right? How like she, like seeing her in like, in this defiance, right? It, with this voice that like growled and she didn't back down and she was all in these men's clothes. I mean, that helped me be alive, you know what I mean? That helped me, you know, speak my own truth, right? And so, yeah, and so, yeah, that's how people come to music, and, and that's why it's vital. I think we have time for one final question. I Oh, wow. <laughs> but I saw you first. <laughs> it's very, yes. Hi, Stu, it's Esther, how are you? Um, he's been talking about, a lot about pedagogy, so I'll just tell you, he came to City University of New York, to Baruch College, and taught a class in uh, the worst of the pandemic. It was all on Zoom in the spring of 2021, and somehow out of that class, he built a musical, which was, perform which was written by the students yes. and performed by the students yes. in the fall of that year. And it was the most extraordinary gift. Um, so George Santos was not in that class. I'm going to underscore that. <laughs> and um, Ursula was here, actually, Stu. I want to let you know. She actually saw you in person for oh, the first oh, time. Awesome, awesome, One awesome. of his students was here. Awesome. And um, so I wanted to thank you for that. But I also wanted to say, you've been talking so much about pedagogy and about improvisation, and obviously, there was a lot of both that went into creating that play out of that really disparate group of CUNY students that showed up on Zoom that you never even met in person. Yeah. And so I just wonder if you could um, connect that to that situation in a more concrete way. I, I, well, the best way I, with that play, you know, a bunch of people who wrote it and we had to put something together. I just feel like, you know, we've already, the thing about like my students, a lot of my students are really into like, well, this part doesn't fit with that part. And I'm like, you know, the, the 20th, the early part of the 20th century, you know, when we were exploring collage, we kind of solved all those, explored all those problems. Doesn't fit doesn't really make sense. You know, I mean, doesn't fit is not a real answer, you know. Uh, doesn't fit. I mean, artistically, you know, it's like you, because the brain loves to put things together. So if you have a squirrel, you know, and then you have the White House, and you have two images, the brain is going to look at the squirrel and look at the White House, and the brain is going to come up with some things. You don't, you know, the, you don't have to worry that oh my God, those two images don't fit. The brain is going to do a lot of work, you know, to make those things fit. So I believe that the, what I told the students at Baruch is that what their play, what, what was going to make the play work is that they were all students at Baruch living right now at this time. And, you know, a lot of people, like, used to think we were being sarcastic and passing strains where, where we said uh, uh, emotions are expendable, uh, there's, uh, but ideas are dependable uh, because there's a new one every week. We, weren't, we were absolutely being serious. Pe emotions are pretty run of the mill. We all kind of feel the same way, but how you frame that emotion to me is what, you know, how you, the detail behind that emotion, you know, but basically I, I just feel collage solved those problems for me, you know, so I don't, I don't worry about things fitting, you know, and that's why improvisation, in, in, when we're so-called improvising, when you're writing in front of people, if you have two thoughts, just say them, just say them and watch what happens. 
Just watch what happens. It will, and the audience will do it for you. You have a hundred brains working with you. So when you say squirrel and White House, every, the New York audience goes, yeah, hell yeah. I know what you mean, brother. Amen. You know, and you're like, fuck. I'm going to say two disparate things again and see what happens. Because that's the, the New York audience is like a brain. It, it makes the connections. The synapses fire. They do. And it especially happens when you're making stuff about race and gender and all those other wonderful things that we're all you know, interested in and terrified of. That wasn't really a question, though, was it? Uh, <laughs> Can uh, we get one more question? That wasn't really a question. Okay, yeah, there was one more question. <laughs> I'll tease you, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yes. Let's see. Completely. Completely. Um, I feel like it's the thing I... Uh, it's the thing I should be doing more so. It's the thing that, that, that makes me feel worthwhile. When I love your applause, I really do. But it's nothing like watching, you know, this guy or that guy or you uh, develop as artists, and to be have the privilege of talking to people who actually might listen to what I'm saying, and maybe like use a fraction of it. Uh, I, my name on a marquee doesn't really have meaning, you know. It doesn't really have me. It doesn't. I don't get, you know, when I every time I get. Every time money is put into my account because of teaching, I giggle because I can't believe they are paying me to do what I used to do in my basement, which is bring people over, listen to records, and talk about them. Do you know what I mean? That's all I'm doing. I'm just the same geek I was at 17, right? So I collaborate with my students. I work with my students. And that is, to me, like this art road, <laughs> to me, was leading to this teaching thing, you know. Uh, uh, it's a tougher audience. <laughs> They're much tougher than you guys will ever be. Yeah, definitely, right? yeah. Um, like, I feel like a performance isn't complete unless my students are there, right? Mm. So I know, like, when I did it yeah. for Deniston Hill and I did a preview, and it was all art world people, and I was like, I want my students to come, I want my students to come, you know, because I feel like, um, yeah, they keep me honest. Yeah. Uh, they're, you know, and if it doesn't play with them, usually that's an indicator, you know. And uh, last night I had a lot of students here and uh, from Columbia, and they're like really sweet. And, uh, and they loved it, and they like love, you know, there are a lot of uh, queer kids, and they were like, yes, yes, big mama thorn, big mama thorn, you know what I mean? And so, yeah, that's exciting, yeah. Well, it's been really exciting and a true pleasure to see you two present this work over the past two days and for being so uh, generous to come and tell us a little bit about your process, about your pedagogy, and your vision. Uh, please. Fabia needs a hand for just being crazy enough to yeah. have like a juke joint. To bring us. To bring a us. A juke joint on the Upper East Side. A juke joint on the Upper East Side. I mean, come um, on. But I wanted to do something, too, because I didn't know the lighting uh, person, uh, their name, and the sound person. Um, We're amazing. Can we call them out? Because, like, they did, uh, yeah. like, really, I mean, phenomenal. Robin, is Robin here, the lighting designer? Oh, yeah, there he is. All right, Robin, yeah. yes. Yeah, like, serious business. And, and Andrew, the audio engineer. Yeah, yeah. And production person, what, Jaden? Jaden Elieff's in the back, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was incredible helping. Um, Rachel, all the Rachel, yeah. the producers around here. Yeah, Rachel's in the back, Rachel yes. Yeah, Rachel Rosado, Claire. Darian. Uh, Darian. Um, I thought everybody was, like, so fantastic and so welcoming. And Tavia, being the visionary who did bring us here to do this new work. And um, I'm very honored and very thrilled, and I thank you. So. Thank you. Please come back in May for our next public program with co-presented with Harlem Stage, Hapa Nizamani. Uh.